us, the Lord Jesus, uh, it's so easy for us to be distracted by the here and now. It's far too easy for us to forget that this world is not our home, that we're just a passing through. If heaven was not our home, oh Lord, what would we do? So what I'm asking for is in the next few minutes, you'd remind us not only that you're coming again, but remind us that you're coming for us and stir our hearts with fresh appreciation for your plan. May the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. That's my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So uh, many years ago, there was a young man. He was a brand new Christian. And he was a college age uh, young man. And when he became a Christian, someone told him about a church-sponsored university where you could attend school. Um, and up until that point in time, he'd never been at a church-sponsored uh, educational institution. So the school he went to is a school in Berrien Springs, Michigan. It's called Andrews University. And there at Andrews University, there is a seminary where people who are studying to become pastors attend. Anyway, this young college man had joined that uh, student body and was so excited. You know, you've heard people talk about, and the scripture refers to your first love. Your first love in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, I wish you'd return to your first love. Um, spiritually speaking, this kid was on fire and he couldn't get enough of Jesus. He couldn't get enough of God's word. Anyway, uh, one of the things that he did to help support his, uh, to help pay his tuition at the university was uh, he had multiple jobs. That one of them was that he was down, down for um, dry mopping the gymnasium floor each evening after recreation had finished and the gym was no longer being used. So um, here he was one particular evening. Uh, it was almost time for the recreation period to be over in anticipation of his job coming up. He had come down and he was sitting on the ground on the sidelines of the gymnasium over there. Um, he had his Bible open on his lap, his legs were folded or crossed and he was reading and he was reading the book of Revelation. He's reading the book of Revelation. And um, so here he is and he's obviously enthralled with what he's reading. It's like, and he's reading. Well, there's these two seminary students, these guys who are gonna become pastors. And they see this guy over there looking at the book of Revelation. And they think perhaps to themselves, I wonder if he understands what he's reading. Maybe this would be an opportunity for us to take our seminary knowledge and go enlighten him. And if you remember, there's a story in the Bible where a guy named Philip is, is uh, running alongside a chariot where there is an Ethiopian guy who is reading scripture. And as Philip runs alongside, he says to the guy in the chariot, he goes, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, well, not exactly. I'm reading scripture about a coming Messiah, and it's not clear to me. So Philip says, I could help you. And so he gets in the chariot. That's the story, okay. So these two seminary students maybe thought themselves kind of Philip's. And they come over to this young greenhorn Christian with his open Bible on his knee, and they say to him, do you understand what you're reading? And he looks up and he says, um, and he takes his fingers and he opens to the beginning of Matthew chapter one. And then he looks back over at Revelation where he's been reading. And he says, I think so. He says, the way I figure, God becomes a baby, and the baby wins. <laughs> it's a pretty good way of summarizing, huh? God becomes a baby, and the baby wins. Well, <clears throat> uh, there's going to come a point in this presentation this morning where you're going to feel inclined to say four words. Um, and so what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you practice saying the four words right now. The four words are going to be these. Amen, come, Lord 
Jesus. Those are the four words. So, amen, come, Lord Jesus. So, let's practice on three, okay? One, two, three. Amen, come, Lord Jesus. You did pretty good, but you weren't very convincing. Think about what you just said. All right, think about what you just said. You know, I'm tempted to give you some coaching. But rather than give you coaching, I'm just going to ask you to think about the words you just used. And I'm going to ask you to try it one more time. And let's see if it's more believable. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three. Amen. Come on, Lord Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, all right. Yes. It was more believable. Very good. Okay, there's going to be a point in this presentation where you're going to want to say those four words. I think you'll probably know when it comes. Um, but anyway, be prepared. The pump's been primed. I'm excited about this presentation. This is entitled, The Term is Over. You know, school across the street, school. There comes a point where you have a, a break. Uh, many students have just come back from being on break. And uh, then there comes a point where the break is like for the whole summer, perhaps, if you're not going to summer sessions. And so you can say, well, the term is over. Well, if you finish, you graduate with your master's, your PhD, your, your whatever it is you graduate with. Uh, there's another sense in which you can say, the term, for me, the term is over, right? Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb right down the middle of the great city, great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. One tree, 12 kinds of fruit. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, at least there. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. He is the light. And they will reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. You get the idea. And ever. What will it be like? We can try to imagine, but it's like trying to imagine jumping over the moon. Can you jump? Can you imagine jumping over the moon? Not really. Try to imagine what it's going to be like. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. A little girl was standing with her father outside the edge of a city. They were beyond the, the light uh, pollution of the city itself, where you can see the stars better. And um, the little girl was holding her father's hands, and they were looking up. It happened to be a clear night sky, no moon, so the stars were exceptionally brilliant, kind of like diamonds laid out on black velvet. And the little girl was just in awe as she looked up at them. And finally, she tugged on her father's hand, and she said to him, Daddy, if this side is so beautiful, just imagine what the other side of heaven must look like. And I thought that was kind of a cool thought. I want us to try to imagine what heaven is like. We can't really, but we can try. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous, but it's good to think about it. We can't comprehend it, but it's still good to think about it. The Bible calls it a country, a country, and we're told that the heavenly shepherd will lead his flock to fountains of living water. Now that's a phrase we're trying to imagine. We're trying to imagine, and that phrase kind of gets my mind going. Fountains of living water. What is that? Marge and I had the privilege of doing this seminar in a place called Dubai. And Dubai is celebrated as being the biggest and best about everything. You know, they have the tallest mount, uh, t buildings and the biggest and best everything. That's what they're all about. Anyway, someone said to us, when your seminar was all over, would you like to go to the top of the world's tallest building? 
Um, and uh, we said yes, and so we did. Well, at the base of the world's tallest building, there is a water display that's probably maybe 20 to 30 acres big. It's huge. And it's got choreographed, computer orchestrated light shows and water shows going on simultaneously. They play music loud enough to be heard for 100 miles. It looks to seem like that to me. Um, and the music and the, and, the, and, the, and the fountains of water are all choreographed. And so we were up there at the top of that building and we're looking down and it is as if the fountains and the water and the spurts and the waterfalls and the showers and the, just all the things that were going on, it was as if they had a mind of their own. It was as if they were living waters as you look down and the music went on. Well, I don't think God's going to need choreographed computer technology to make fountains of living water, but somehow it says the shepherd, Jesus, will lead his flock beside fountains of living Living water. We're told that there's going to be a tree called the tree of life and it yields its fruit every month and there are 12 different fruits that it yields. Different fruit each month which is sort of an amazing thing to think about. Um, and it also says that the leaves of that tree will be for the healing of the nations. Would you say the nations could use some healing? I think so. Ever flowing streams so they don't dry up in the summertime. Ever flowing streams clear as crystal beside waving trees that are just shade and beauty and, and uh, we'll be able to walk these paths along the rivers. There'll be wide spreading plains that swell up into lofty mountains. Mountains that are probably going to make Mount Everest look like a foothill by comparison. Lofty mountain peaks. We're told the mountains of God will rear their lofty summits. I can't wait to see that. You know, where we live when we're not traveling is in the state of Washington. And there they have a mountain called Mount Rainier. And when Mount Rainier is visible, it's not visible a lot of the time because there's a lot of um, rain and gray skies in the state of Washington. But on the days when the rain is cleared up and the skies are clear, one of the most common things that people say to each other as they walk into a store, they'll say, did you see the mountain? They'll say things like that. It's very common. You know, you'll be, you go up to the cash register, the cash, cashier will say something like, mountain's out today, you know? Um, a 14,000 foot mountain covered with glaciers and snow towering above the Seattle basin. Um, imagine the mountains of God rearing their lofty summits and the redeemed say, did you see the mountains? Whoa! Rainier would be so humbled. In the, in, 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 Rainier wouldn't even try to show in front of that group of mountains. It would just sort of hang its head and, and be very, you know, humble about the whole thing. Anyway, on those peaceful plains below the lofty peaks, we're told God's people, so long pilgrims on planet Earth will finally find their home. Finally find their home. You know, one of the things you see sometimes is a mat at the front door and it'll say, welcome home. Well, there's probably going to be a mat as we get off of the transportation vehicle that brings us to heaven. And that mat's probably going to say, welcome home, children. Pain cannot exist in heaven. Pain can't even exist. Have you ever taken a candle or seen someone do it, light it, and then place a jar over the top of it? Ever seen that happen? What happens to the flame? It goes out. Why does the flame go out? Out of oxygen. So the atmosphere within that jar makes it so that flame cannot burn. And the atmosphere of heaven makes it so pain cannot exist. There'll be no sorrow, no crying. No one will ever say they feel sick. There'll be no coughs. There'll be no sore throats. There'll be no uh, eyeglasses. There'll be no hearing aids. There'll be no canes. There'll be no wheelchairs. There'll be no walkers. There'll be no funerals. No terminal illnesses. No illnesses of any kind. Huh. And we will see Jesus face to face. See him face to face without any dimming veil between. You remember when Moses came back down from the mountain, the people of Israel said, please put a veil on. Your face is shining with glory from heaven and we can't bear to look at you. Well, the face of Jesus is going to be brighter than the face of Moses was when he came off the mountain. And you're going to be able to look in, in the eye. You know, and sometimes you maybe heard somebody describe another person as, oh, that person has such a radiant smile. A radiant smile. You haven't seen a radiant smile till you see Jesus smile. He's going to smile. And he, another way we would say, he has a smile that dazzles. He has a dazzling smile. 
glory like the sun streaming from him. We'll stand in his presence. We'll behold his glory. We'll get to talk with holy angels. You'll get to talk with your angels. By the way, I think everybody has two. That's my own opinion. Um, and the reason I think so is that we're told that the, that the two angels who came to the tomb on resurrection morning and said, Son of God, come forth. Your father calls you. They were Jesus' guardian angels during the time he was on planet Earth. And Jesus, we're told, had no advantage over us. So, I'm just saying, maybe we have two angels too. I think it's probably a good thing if we do, because my one angel, if I just had one, would probably be saying, man, could I get some help down here? <laughs> this guy is a real pain, you know? And the other angel, my other angel would say, oh, man, I was on break, you know? <laughs> Don't make me come. Anyway, imagine talking with your angels. Imagine hearing from your angel about their intervention and interceding and their protection, times you didn't even know about it. You might say, oh man, I know my angel was there when that guy almost cut me off on the freeway and so on, and the angel will laugh and go, oh, that was nothing. You didn't even know about what's happened over here. You saw that one, but let me tell you what I was doing over here, you know? Wow. Hear the stories from your angel of their activity in your life. We'll get to talk with angels. We'll get to socialize with God's faithful people throughout the history of the planet. Won't that be something? Talking with Enoch. Talking with Mary of Magdala. Talking with the mother of Jesus. Saying, so what was it like to raise him? You know? Um, did he ever cry? You know? Uh, did, you know? Tell us about, you know, just imagine having a conversation with these different people that you read about in the scriptures. Immortal minds will contemplate with never failing delight the wonders of God's creative power and the mysteries of his redeeming love. The plan of salvation will just boggle our mind. You know, one of the reasons that the plan of salvation will boggle our minds even more when we get to heaven is because we're going to see what Jesus left in order to go here, come here, to fix what we're wrong. And not just what he left. We have, we'll, be, we'll be reminded when we get there and we see Jesus there, Jesus glorified there, we'll realize he didn't just leave this gorgeous place. He left being commander in chief. He left the adoration of cherubim and seraphim. He left a place where his word was their delight. He left a place where people, where, where the created beings that were in that place, they, 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 for them, their highest joy was just being around him. And anything he said, if there was something they could do, brought them even more joy to do it. And he walked away from that. And he didn't just walk away from it. You know, in Garden of Gethsemane, don't forget this. When Jesus died, wages of sin or death, nobody on planet earth has died yet. Nobody. The death that's the, that's the wage of sin is called the second death. The first death is sleep. Jesus calls the first death sleep. It's like sleep. You're unconscious, but it's like sleep. And if you're a Christian, a friend of Jesus, you're going to wake up from sleep and you're going to live forever. If you're not a Christian, you're going to wake up from sleep. There'll be a final judgment and then you're going to be dead forever. That's the second death. And when Jesus died on Calvary to be the sacrifice for sin, he died the second death. Now, here's what I want you to think about for just a minute. There's no coming back from the second death. The second death is eternal. So when Jesus died, in order for him to be the substitute for the second death, Jesus had to feel like he was not coming back. Jesus had to feel that way. Because if he thought he was coming back, it wouldn't be the second death. Do you follow what I'm saying? So when Jesus leaves heaven, and all that we were just trying to mention a moment ago, and then he comes here, and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is willing. This is why the mysteries of God's redeeming love will never be something we'll ever get tired of thinking about. He is actually saying, if I have to be gone for 
ever to give anybody on this planet a chance, then I'm all in. And that just boggles my mind. It boggles my mind right now, and I haven't even seen heaven yet. It boggles my mind right now, and I haven't seen the, the adoration of the seraphim and the cherubim, cherubim for, for Jesus. I haven't seen what he walked away from, and it already boggles my mind. He walked away, and he was willing to walk away forever. Now, I know you might be thinking in your mind, and I don't want you to get too distracted. I have a whole series on this, so I can't take the time to expand on it at the moment. But you might be thinking in your mind, but didn't Jesus say to the disciples, I'll meet you in Galilee after I'm resurrected, and so on and so on. You might think that. Yes, he knew that that was the plan. But at the point of Calvary and Gethsemane, all hope was pulled out from under him. And the reason hope was pulled out from under him was because it wouldn't be the second death if he thought he was coming back at that point. So Jesus was made to feel like it wasn't going to work. That's why in Gethsemane he said, Father, Father, is there some other way? Can we do this differently? Can we go back to the drawing board? Can you redo, send the camp computer technology team back and see if they can come up with another way? Is there three times... He asks for another way. Do you know why he's asking for another way? Because he's feeling like it's not going to work. He had to feel that way or it wouldn't be the second death. And it boggles my mind to think he left the splendor of heaven and was willing to give it up forever for you and me. And we will contemplate throughout eternity the mysteries of redeeming love. Now back to the concepts of what is heaven going to be like. Some more. Learning, you know, or across the street from a university, learning will not be wearisome. It will not be challenging. You won't say to yourself, oh, man, I got to take that prerequisite before I take that class. Oh, no, and I don't even want to take that class. That one's required for my major. Are you kidding? Is there some, can I get this one somewhere else? You know, can I do this online? Is there some way I can get that credit some other way? Uh, we won't have any of that. We will, learning will be a breeze, it will be a joy, and we'll never get exhausted or tired. Oh, and here's something else. As we learn, the things that we're going to discover and learn in heaven are beyond um, imagination. Uh, sci scientists today tell us that as far as they can tell, using microscopic um, you know, like like atomic, going into subparticles and in and in and in, further and further and further, they say that it appears to them that going in is infinite. And when they use the telescopes and go out, they say that appears to be infinite. Every time they find a day, every time they increase the power of the magnitude of their telescope, they say, oh, huh, there's more. Oh, there's more. So they haven't ever come to the point where they say, we think we've reached the end of the universe. They say, we've seen all we can see so far until the next telescope comes out, you know, until the new iPhone comes out, until whatever it is comes out. And we're told that we're smack dab in the middle of the very large and the very small. So think about that. Think about that. One of the things we're going to get to do when we get to heaven is going to be able to explore micro and macro. We're going to be able to see the very small and the very large. Imagine going into, you know, people do river trips through the Grand Canyon. Imagine doing a river trip through somebody's veins or arteries and going into their heart. Boom, boom, boom. And you're being sent on your raft through. Boom, and it keeps surging every time the heart beats. Boom, you go a little faster. Imagine going in as well as going out. And seeing what God has done. Seeing the nervous system going in, going in, going in, as well as going out. There's no limit to the things that we're going to understand and learn and grow. Immortal minds will never fail uh, of enjoying and contemplating with never feeling delight the wonders of God's creation and his power. Also, there the grandest dreams may be carried forward. So your wildest dreams or aspirations. Oh, here's a cool thought. When you get to heaven, you can do anything you want. That might sound a little crazy. But you know why you can do anything you want when you get to heaven? Because God will have so completed the work he started in your life and heart. He was so purified your motives and your character and your mind and your heart that everything that you would ever want to do would be in perfect harmony and alignment with everything that heaven's about. So you could do anything you wanted and it would be perfectly appropriate because you would never want anything that wasn't appropriate. So imagine the dreams and aspirations that you could pursue. 
and grow and develop and understand. And then once you've understood this and then built on that and understood this and then built on that, and that there'll be more to grow. Never fail. No end. New, new heights to surmount, surmount. New wonders to admire. New truths to comprehend. Fresh treasures to marvel at. Oh, and then we're told that unfettered by mortality, the redeemed will wing their tireless flights through worlds afar. Think about that. Right now we have to use, you know, rockets. And all we've done is just get barely out into the shallows of our own galaxy. Just the shallows, you know. And our galaxy is a speck in the sea of galaxies. And you'll wing your tireless flight to worlds afar. I have a hunch that we actually won't be going like this. Someone says, how far is that world we're going to anyway, you know? No, I have a feeling that you'll probably be able to travel as fast as the speed of thought, which is way faster than the speed of light. And we won't have to sit for hours on a plane next to somebody else to get to wherever you're going. No. Um, do you remember when uh, Daniel was given a vision and he was asking God in prayer to give him understanding? And Gabriel comes to give him understanding? One well, of the first things Gabriel says to Daniel is he says, Loved, blessed are you, Daniel, beloved of God. When you first started your prayer, God sent me to come and tell you what you want to know. Now, if you read Daniel's prayer that he's praying, it takes less than three minutes to read the prayer. And Gabriel says, I was at the side of the throne of the universe when you started praying. And God said, go down there and talk to that guy. So here I am, whoosh, less than three minutes from the center of the universe. That's faster than... And we're going to do that. With undimmed vision, we're going to gaze upon the glories of creation and the years of eternity are just going to roll by. And nobody's going to say, this is sure boring. I've sure run out of stuff to do. Nobody's ever going to say, what are we going to do? You know, sitting on a cloud and plucking on a harp. All that ledges, who wants that? You know, I believe that's one of the, de- <laughs> I believe that was, that was one of the devil's ideas to get us. So we say, well, I don't want to go there. You know, now, the last thing children want at summer camp is rest, period. You know, the reason they have rest period at summer camp is for the counselor. It's not for the kids. We get to heaven, we're not going to want rest period. We're going to say, oh man, next? What else? Oh, that? Oh, I haven't done that yet. Oh man, yeah, tell me. Have you been there? No, I'd like to go. We want to go again? I'll go. Let's go. Boom. I mean, there's just never no end. No end. The years of eternity will roll, bringing richer and more glorious Wonders and richer and more glorious revelations of the love of God and Christ Jesus. Marge, let's see what the next slide says. I don't know for sure what it says. Okay. Oh, how much we lose. By not educating the imagination to dwell upon divine things instead of upon the earthly. We may give fullest scope to the imagination, and yet, next slide, please. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Margie, would you, next slide, Margie, let's see what it says. Lead the children. Lead the children to think about the glories of the reward that awaits God's people. Cultivate their imaginative powers by picturing the splendor of the new earth and the city of God. And when they are charmed with the prospect, tell them, it's going to be better than that. Tell them it's going to be more glorious than their brightest imagination can portray. So the counsel that was contained in that little paragraph was this. You need to talk to the kids. And you need to get their minds a-going. You need to talk to them about what heaven's going to be like. Margie's mom takes the kids out to see the mansions. And then says, all right, what do you think of those? What do you think of those? What do you think of that one, that one, that one, that one? Whoa! And then she says, guess what? You ain't seen nothing yet. 
You think that was amazing? Wait till you see what God's got for you. She was doing what that counsel said. Lead the kids to try to imagine the glories of heaven. And when you've done it, then tell them, it's going to be so much better than that. It was like your imagination was just nothing but dark sky compared to what? What? So, I want to tell you something that I came across in a book by a guy named C.S. Lewis. He was writing a children's story, and he was trying to help children imagine what heaven was going to be like. And the story that I want to draw from is a story entitled The Last Battle. And at the end of that story, he has these children actually going to heaven, and when they get there, I want to tell you what he says. These children, have walked, they have suddenly found themselves in heaven. Here they are, a group of children, a handful of children. And as they arrive, suddenly they discover something. They discover that they have inside them energy like they have never had before, and they have this insatiable desire to run. They just want to run. And so they take off running. Have you ever noticed how young kids run everywhere they go? They run there at the playground. They're here, they're there. They just run. I say, oh my, when did I lose that? You know, those little kids. And so they land in heaven. They want to run. And so they take off and they're running. Oh, and not only are they running, they can run faster than horses. And not only can they run faster than horses, they don't even get tired. And they can have conversations because they're not out of breath as they run. Lewis is trying to imagine for children what heaven's going to be like. So here's these kids. And Lewis says, I think if you could run without ever getting tired and not ever out of breath, that probably you would never want to stop running. He says that. So here are these kids. And they're just racing across the terrain. And there's an eagle flying above them. And they're keeping up with the speed of the eagle as they run. And then as they run and rush across this beautiful landscape, suddenly they hear this rumble from up ahead. It's actually thundering. The noise is getting louder and louder. And, and they, they come a little closer and they realize what it is. It's causing the noise. It's a waterfall. A waterfall tumbling off of over the top of a cliff that is so high that the cliff appears to be lost in the clouds. This, high, this, this is this incredible, wonderful waterfall. And it's just this huge volume of water pouring off of the top of that cliff, which appears to be almost miles up into the, into, the, uh, into the sky. And as it hits the ground, there's this huge cauldron where the water, boom, pounds into the ground. And, there's, and, and, and the cauldron is just teeming and seething like boiling water, turbulent as the water just, boom, hits and churns. And the kids look at, you, look at each other as they approach the cauldron, the pool, and they look at each other like, do we dare? Do you, do you, think, do you think it would be okay? And they plunge in, to the cauldron of churning water, and they swim across the, without without being injured, without getting hurt. They swim through the turbulent waters to the base of the waterfall, and then they start swimming up the waterfall, up the waterfall. And as they swim up the waterfall, the water parts over their foreheads, and it causes spray on each side of their forehead and rainbows as they swim up through rainbows, up, up, up the waterfall to the top. But when they get to the top, they crest the top of the waterfall, and here's the gigantic river that's pouring over the rim. And they swim faster than you would sw you drive in a jet boat. They swim up river, and eventually they kind of come off to the shore, huge, huge, beautiful sandy beach. And the beach is right in a promontory where a valley kind of goes up with another river coming down to feed the bigger river. And they decide that they're going to run up the valley. And so they turn and they start running up the valley. Somebody says, further up and further in. And so they go further up and further in. And as they keep going up the valley, uh, it gets steeper and steeper. And they start going up through that the terrain begins to change and the, and the, um, the, the cover, the ground cover begins to change and the vegetation begins to change and, and, and it's beautiful beyond description, beautiful beyond belief. They keep going up higher and higher and higher. They go up one ridge, and up higher another, another ridge, another ridge, and then all of a sudden they come to a plateau. And at this plateau, they see a wall, a great big wall. Well, it's a garden wall and there's a garden on the inside of the wall. And the wall's too big to go over but they just know intuitively that there's a garden on the other side. So they start running around the side of the wall and they come to a gate into the garden. 
and they look at the gate. The gate's closed, and they look at each other. Do we dare try to see if we can get in? And just as they're going to push against the gate, the gate opens up on its own. And a voice from inside the garden says, further up and further in. And so they go, yes. And they go running into the garden. As they run into the garden, now remember, Lewis is trying to get children to understand and imagine a little bit of what it's going to be like to go to heaven. And as they go into the garden, suddenly they're met by all of the people they had loved so dearly who had died. Grandpa, grandma, maybe a mom or dad that had died of an illness, maybe a brother or sister that had died in young, you know, in childhood. Anyway, they're there. They're there, and they all come, and there's this grand reunion, and there's hugs, and there's handshakes, and there's high fives as everybody. Oh, and not only do they see these people that they have missed on planet Earth, they're in their prime. You know, there's a woman's clothing store called Forever 21. Yeah, well, they're Forever 21. Everybody's Forever 21 in heaven. And uh, so that grandfather that they had seen in his older age, toddling along with his cane or his walker, now he is 21, and he greets them and gives them hugs. But then a voice says, further up and further in. And so they start going further into the garden, and then one of the children says to another one of the children, do you know what? This garden seems bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. Now, how do you figure that? And one of the children responds and says this, you know what I'm thinking? She says, once on planet Earth, there was a stable that held something bigger than the universe. The further in you go, the bigger it gets. And so the voice says, further up and further in. And so they come, they continue. There's these ridges that are now starting to go up over these lofty peaks. There's one giant lofty peak above, towering above all the rest. It's the Everest in that particular part of where they are. And, and, and there's these ridges coming down with glaciers and with giant steps and huge cliffs. And the children discover something that's really amazing. As they run uphill, they don't get tired and they can actually jump, like in the movies with the trick photography, they can jump up boulders up cliffs they can boing and they're there and they keep going and they're jumping and they're going higher and higher and as they're going higher and higher suddenly they stop and they gasp because they're from higher up coming down the same ridge that they're going up and taking multiple steps at a time boom 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 is the lord jesus christ he's coming towards them he's got his arms open and they can't believe it they can't believe it they go oh oh and and, and as he's coming towards them all of a sudden they look at each other and they look really sad at each other because they all think we're dreaming this isn't real i wish it was real it's not real we're dreaming and as Jesus approaches them, their hearts leap when he says these words to them. Children, he says, the term is over. The holidays have begun. The dream is ended. This is the morning. You're not dreaming. This is the morning. And then Lewis concludes. I'm going to read you the paragraph at the end of the book. This is what he says. As he spoke these words, the things that began to happen after that were so great and so beautiful that I cannot write them. And so for us, he says, that's the end of the stories. But we can most truly say about them that they lived happily ever after. For them, he says, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story which no one on earth has ever read, but which goes on forever and in which every chapter is always better than the one that preceded it. Oh, don't you love it? Well, we just tried to imagine along with Lewis, and now the author of this quote that I put on the screen a moment ago says, then say to everybody, it's better than that. It's better than that. Way better than that. Will you be there? Will I be there? We don't need to be uncertain about this. If you're seeking to become better acquainted with Jesus day by day, you have a relationship with him, then these words are for you. 1 John 5, 11 to 13. God has given us what kind of life? Eternal life. And this life is in his what? Son. He who has the son. To have the son means do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you spend time talking with him? Do you get to know him better day by day? If you do, you have a relationship with Jesus. That means you have the son. He who has the son has what? What kind of life? 
eternal life. And he who does not have the Son does not have eternal life. It goes on. These things I write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Why? So that you may know you have eternal life. Can you know if you have eternal life? According to scriptures, can you know if you have eternal life? Yes. What's it based on? Having a friendship with Jesus. So can you know if you talk to Jesus today? Yep. Can you know if you've um, read about his life recently? Yep. Can you know if you've had a conversation with anybody else about how cool he is? Yep. If you can know those things, then you know you have a relationship with Jesus. If you know you have a relationship with Jesus, you can also know you have eternal life. This is good news. This is better news than many of us have ever heard. Jesus wants you there. That's not all. He wants you there. In John 17, verse 24, Jesus said, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am. He wants you there. It's not just, do you want to go? It's like Jesus going, please, I want you here. If you're not here, I'm going to be empty. There's going to be a hole that will never be filled forever if you're missing. That's how Jesus feels about you. Do I really want him to return? Now, here's a question. I want you to ask this very seriously of yourself. Do I really want Jesus to return? Don't answer it out loud. Don't raise your hand. Don't open your mouth. Just think, do I really want Jesus to return? Or am I just interested in an end of pain and hardship? See, do I really want him to come back? Or do I just not want any more pain? Which is it? Well, there's a way to know how serious you are about wanting him to return. There's a way. And just you answer this one in your own mind. Not out loud, not with anybody else. Here's how you can tell whether you really want Jesus to return. How eagerly do I look forward to opening up the Gospels and spending time with him in his word tomorrow morning and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? How eagerly do I look forward to time with Jesus now? Because here's the deal. If I'm not finding it attractive to spend time with Jesus day by day, if the sum total of my time with Jesus is church once a week, and guess what? I'm really not interested in him. Because if I was interested in him, I'd be hanging out with him as often as I could. So if I'm not hanging out with him now, guess what? I really don't want him to return. Because do you know what? If I didn't find it comfortable to spend even 10 minutes in his presence on Monday morning, do you know what it would be like to have to spend eternity with someone I hadn't been wanting to hang out with here? It would be a hell of a heaven to have to spend eternity with somebody I was not attracted to on planet Earth, except maybe at church. You get what I'm trying to say? So it does, if, if, if that's the reality check for you, and in your own quietness of your own mind, you said, you know what, Pastor Lee, you just sort of opened my eyes to the reality. I seem to be more interested in the news or in this, that, or the other thing than I am in time with Jesus as I start my day. That doesn't have to stay that way. You have, you have breath. You have life. You have God's word. You can talk to him. You can start today. You can start tomorrow. You can enter into a relationship with Jesus that begins now and continues until he comes. And the more time you spend with him day by day, the more eagerly you're going to want to see him return. It's sort of a direct correlation. The more time you spend with him, the more you want him to come back. One more verse or quotation. When we respond to Jesus' invitation, come learn of me, we begin the life eternal. It starts now. You don't have to wait to go to heaven. You can start life eternal now. As through Jesus, we enter into the rest. Heaven begins here. So I'm going to read you one more paragraph. It's a bit of a long one, but I think it's so cool. I just want to read the whole thing. We are almost home. We will soon hear the voice of the Savior, richer than any music, saying, Your warfare is finished. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Blessed, blessed benediction. Oh, I want to hear it from his immortal lips. I want to see the king in his beauty. I want to see the whole heavenly host casting their glittering crowns at the feet of Jesus and then touching their golden harps. I want to see them fill all heaven with songs to the Lamb. I want to praise him. I want to honor him that sits on the throne. I want my voice to echo and re-echo through the courts of heaven. See, it's not life forever in world without pain that's so attractive. 
It's not absence of pain. It's not presence of love, joy, peace, freedom, beauty, or wonder. It's Him. What makes heaven heaven is Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says it this way. So, referring to heaven, we will always be with who? The Lord. That's what makes heaven heaven. A little urchin, a little street urchin in, in the streets of London was once asked by a passerby who saw her poor pitiful kind of begging there for some money. And they said to her, I don't know why they said it, but they said to her, little girl, <clears throat> they said to her, where do you think heaven is? Kind of a cruel question to ask a poor little urchin. And the little girl said, wherever Jesus is, that's heaven. And she had it right. She nailed it. I want to go to heaven because I want to see Jesus. I want to watch Jesus. I want to watch him for a long time. I want to watch Jesus doing math problems with my formerly learning disabled sister. I have a sister who was born learning disabled. She doesn't even understand how one and one can make two. That doesn't work for her mind. But I can't wait to watch Jesus and her do math. I can hear him saying, okay, so Lynn, that's my sister's name, Lynn, what's the square root of 973? Boom, and Lynn will nail it. And Jesus will say, high five, you know? I can't wait to watch that. I can't wait to watch Jesus dance. Yes, I said the word dance with Johnny Erickson. You guys know who Johnny Erickson, ever heard of Johnny Erickson? She's quadriplegic. Johnny Erickson, she dove into a shallow river when she was 16 years old, broke her neck, and has been paralyzed ever since. I can't wait to see Jesus and Johnny dancing. And I imagine that Jesus will be saying to her, oh, great moves, Johnny. Ah, oh, man, you are, you, are, you are perfection in motion, you know? I can't wait. Can't wait to see Jesus running with Stephen right over here. Running with Stephen. Stephen, let's go. Let's do laps around the lake. What do you say? Stephen says, I'm there. Yeah, leave that thing behind. I'm there. I can't wait to see Jesus pushing formerly homeless children on swings in their own backyards. Jesus pushed them. They were homeless, but now they're there in their own backyard. Jesus pushing them on swings. Wow, I can't wait to watch Jesus watching Helen Keller paint landscapes. Do you know Helen Keller was born blind? Right? And so I, can, I can't wait to watch Jesus looking over her shoulder. She's got an easel. She's got some paint. She's painting. Maybe she's painting them the mountains of majesty above the city of the New Jerusalem. And Jesus looks over her shoulder and he goes, Oh, Helen, you captured it. Good job. It looks better than real life, Helen. Can't wait. I can't wait to see Jesus traveling freely through space with people who formerly had been slaves or prisoners. Now they're free. Free. Like Martin Luther King said. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. We're free at last. I can't wait to watch Jesus joining a bunch of former orphans in singing happy birthday to a guy named George Mueller who created orphanages for thousands of orphans in England. And Jesus goes, okay, kids, let's sing happy birthday to George. What do you say? And they join Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus looking into the beautiful face of a little girl that my wife had as a student in her classroom. Many, many years ago, this little girl, because of drugs her mother took while she was carrying the baby before she was born, she was born with a face that was so deformed that she had, I don't know, dozens, not just one or two, she had dozens of reconstructive surgeries to her face to try to make her look like she was human. And I can tell you that when she was in my, class, my wife's class, just seeing that brave little girl come to school and sit in a classroom with people who had faces just made me weep. Brave little girl. Heart of gold. Sweetheart. Loving. Wonderful girl. In spite of her disfigurement, I can't wait to see Jesus cupping her cheeks in his hands and saying to her, Lorena, you're so beautiful, I can't take my eyes off of you. Amen. That's the kind of stuff I can't wait to see. I can't wait to see Jesus talking with my father-in-law, who was an only child, about what it's like to be alone. Because Jesus understood and understands. I can't wait to see Jesus recalling memories with former Alzheimer's patients. Hey, you remember that? And they're going, yeah, 
I'd never forget that. I can't wait to watch Jesus singing praises to God with some of my friends from a church I used to pastor who were deaf and mute. And they would sit on the front row. And when the songs of praise were being sung and the lyrics were on the screen, they would sing with their hands. It was just to watch them. They stand with everybody else and they're doing like this. I can't wait to watch Jesus sing with them. Sing with them. I can't wait to watch Jesus counting to 95 with a guy named Martin Luther. Perhaps you heard of something called the 95 Theses. I can't wait to watch him show Martin Luther the mighty fortress, which is our God. That's a song that Martin Luther wrote. And Jesus goes, let me show you. Let me show you what you wrote about. There it is. Right there. I can't wait to watch Jesus shaking hands with a fellow at the Walmart in our hometown who was born with no arms. All he has is hands sticking out of his shoulders. And I can't wait to watch Jesus doing high fives, high tens with him in heaven. I can't wait to watch Jesus walking the streets with Mother Teresa. I can't wait to watch Jesus embracing some former lepers. I can't wait to watch Jesus talking with my father's mother, my grandmother, who had a mastectomy about what it's like to live with scars, because he knows. I can't wait to watch Jesus sharing a cup of water from the river of life with some former AIDS patients. I can't wait to watch Jesus braiding my mother-in-law's hair, which she lost three times during chemotherapy. I can't wait to watch Jesus giving high fives to a friend of mine who has cerebral palsy and can't control his arms except spastically. I can't wait to watch Jesus doing needlepoint with some ladies who used to have Parkinson's. I can't wait to watch Jesus singing duets with Fanny Crosby and telling her the story of Jesus. Fanny Crosby was blind, and one of the hymns she wrote was Face to Face. Someday I'll see him face to face. I can't wait to see that happen. I can't wait to watch Jesus talking with Abraham Lincoln about some things Lincoln thought would be little noted nor long remembered. I can't wait to watch Jesus eating peaches, pineapple, watermelons with former diabetics. No worries. No problem. Seconds? How about fourths? I can't wait to watch Jesus building sandcastles with some kids from South African shanty towns. If you've ever seen a shanty town, oh, that just makes your heart ache too. And I can't wait to watch Jesus building sandcastles with those kids. I can't wait to watch Jesus doing power aerobics with former grandparents. I can't wait. I can't wait to watching Jesus to watch Jesus talking with my dad about all the traveling they did together as he had a one string violin. My dad was a preacher and he only talked about Jesus. That's all he, he couldn't know how he didn't know how to talk about anything else. One string on his violin. And I can't wait to see Jesus talking with him about the one string. I can't wait to see Jesus attend your family reunion. See, I want to be like a little fly on the wall. Maybe there's no flies in heaven. I don't know. But I want to be a fly in the wall at your family reunion as Jesus shows up. And I just want to watch the all of you having grand times with him as the celebrated guest of honor at your family. You know, it's going to be just great to watch him. And then some century or maybe some millennia, there'll be a knock at the door. And I'll open the door and it'll be Jesus. And he'll say, yo, Lee. Just wondered if you had some time to go for a walk. I happen to be in the area. And I'll say to him, Jesus, because of you, I have time. <laughs> I have forever. And we'll go for a long walk in the same direction. Right now we're on the wrong side of the door. C.S. Lewis says, but all the leaves of the New Testament are rustling with the rumor it will not always be so. One day the term will be over. And the holidays will have begun. Revelation 22 ends this way. Then the angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Behold, I am coming soon. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega. Who's talking here? Who's talking? Jesus. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am the bright and morning star. He said, I'm coming. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. All right, listen to the closing song. You did good. Doctor called and told them, you know it won't be long. You better come and hurry, cause soon he will be gone. So with eyes ever glistening, soon they were listening to his last words. He said, you know I love you. You're my family, you're my friends And I love someone else who has promised well, This is not the end Cause no matter what beset me He's gonna come and get me At the last trump At the last trump When the angels fill the sky Going to a landfill Don't you want to be there At the last drop The Apostle Paul When he spoke of death Said don't you be naive We have a hope in Jesus Christ Don't grieve like others grieve Remember when you're moaning there will be joy in the morning At the last drop At the last drop When the angels fill the skies At the last drop When my Redeemer's drawing nigh I'm going to a land fair Don't you want to be at the last drop, no more diagnosis, x-ray, chemo, wheelchairs, lab test, morphine, needles, pain and suffering have to go when we hear that trumpet. for you. Lord Jesus, the answer is a loud, resounding yes. Yes. We do want to be there. Mm -hmm. And I want to be there with all of these new friends in you too. And I don't want anything that the enemy can do to keep us from that. Mm -hmm. So please keep our eyes on you. Yes. So Lord. that the more we look to you, 
you can make the things of this earth grow strangely mm -hmm. dim in the light of your glory and grace. That's what we want. We want to be more attracted with the things that are lasting forever than we are with the things that are going to fade away. Yes. We want that for ourselves. We want that for everybody here. Mm -hmm. And not only do we want it for everybody here, we'd like it to spill over from us yes. all here to others because mm -hmm. we want to see heaven so full that it just seems crowded. That's Amen. what we'd like. It would be great Amen. to be crowded in heaven. So, Lord Jesus, continue to draw each one of us your direction, morning by morning and day by day, not just once a week at church, but yes. every day. That's yes. my prayer for myself and everybody here Amen. in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Bless you. See you at the top. Amen. See you at the top.